Hey everyone, welcome to week seven. I'm gonna get started in about two minutes. Feel free to get comfortable, stretch out, say hi in the chat. Hey Jarvis. <clears throat> hey Dave, welcome. Hey Joshua, <laughs> we will play something very shortly. Hey Dimitri. All right, three o'clock it is. Welcome everybody to week seven of Audio Coding with Super Collider. Hey Caleb. Today we're gonna to talk about an introduction to sampling in Super Collider. So that includes sampling the creative process, how we deal with audio files, reading them in from our hard drive, loading them into an object called buffers, and playing them back with uh, a couple of uGems. So everything we've done so far has been very, very heavily oriented towards synthesis, basically 100% synthesis and some filtering, I guess. We've been doing sine waves, sawtooth waves, blah, 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 white noise, pink noise, you name it. But we're actually gonna start working with sound files today. And so the object of interest is a buffer. All right, so just a little bit about what a buffer is. A buffer is basically the server side version of array. So it's an ordered collection of numbers. Um, a, a language side array can contain anything, integers, floats, strings, whatever. Uh, a buffer, which is basically the server's version of array, only contains floats. And uh, most often we use buffers to hold, uh, uh, we ho to hold uh, audio samples that represent a sound or a sound file. Um, so it's, um, it's, a, it's a server object, just like synth and synth def. So it's one of a few objects that actually requires communication between client and server, or the language side and server side. So the first thing we're going to do is boot the server. <clears throat> so uh, the, the main method we use for reading a sound file into a buffer is a class method called uh, read. So buffer.read. And buffer.read takes a few arguments. The two arguments that we see here are the most important ones. We can specify those and kind of forget about everything else, but at minimum buffer.read uh, needs to know the, the audio server that the sound file is going to be read into. Like wh where is this buffer going to live? What server? And in almost every case, you're dealing with the local instance of the, the audio server application running on your computer, which uh, as we know, and as we've seen right here, is conveniently stored for us in the global variable or uh, S. So we say put this on our local server S and then what we need is a, a path, an absolute path. This is the sort of file path that you would, uh, you know, that the way you describe it in like a command line application on your computer. So I have three sound files that I've prepared for this lecture. A motorcycle and then these two numbers uh, so I'll just play these in audacity first um, so here is uh, this recording of a motorcycle that I made back in like 2011 
and I have also got uh, these two numbers recordings. Now, these are excerpts from uh, an album called The Conet Project, which is something uh, one of my students clued me into when I was a teaching assistant back at University of Texas. Uh, it's basically a four, four-disc set of a bunch of mysterious, origin-unknown, shortwave radio broadcast recordings. Um, it's uh, it's pretty weird. It's kind of weird stuff. Uh, all of these are freely available as MP3s, and you can find links to these on the Wikipedia page for the Conet Project. So uh, I have this recording, which is just like someone reading these numbers. Two, two, five, one. Two, one, one, zero. And then I have a, a shorter version of it. Just, just uh, went in. Two, one, one, zero. Just so we have like a short recording to work with. So I don't know if we're going to use all these, but it's what I brought to the table today. So we need to provide a path to these files. Like in Mac OS, we can do command I on a file to get its info, and we can see its path is, you know, probably somewhere in here. Uh, I, you know, there's, there's two easy ways to do this. One is to uh, actually copy the file, you know, which we can just do with um, command C. And then we can paste it in here with command V. And uh, as a convenience, this, this has the result of actually copying the path to the file rather than trying to somehow dump an actual audio file into the code interface. So that's a convenient way to do it. You can copy and paste a file. Uh, alternatively, you can drag and drop like that. As Brandon pointed out, you can also drag and drop. So two very convenient ways to read a sound file. Now, we could run this and it would work, but uh, we're forgetting something very important. We need to give the result of this line of code uh, a name uh, because we'd like to actually, we want to read this buffer into memory and then use a, a variable, language side, so that we can actually refer to this buffer and say, play that buffer, play that buffer backwards, play only a part of that buffer, etc. So that's the... That's the basic idea for reading sound files in. And from here, the quickest and easiest and I guess sort of messiest way to play it is to just take the variable holding a reference to the buffer and say dot play. Yeah, and I'm gonna hit command period on that. It might be kind of loud. Sorry if that's a little startling. Um, there's really not a lot of flexibility you have with this particular method. I, I primarily use this to just say, did it work? Did it load into memory? Was there a problem? So we just read it, buffer.read, server, absolute path, and then we can just see if it worked with play. A um, couple of things to keep in mind. If you want to read audio files in a super collider, they have to be either AIFF or WAV format. You can't do MP3s, um, at least not natively. There might be some weird extension somebody made that allows SuperCollider to read mp3s, but um, they've got to be uncompressed audio files, AIF or WAV. Um, we've got these three files here, and we could we could load them all in, I guess. We can say, um, let's just copy and paste this line. We'll say num for the numbers. So let's change the path here. And for the longer one, I'm just going to put a capital L at the end of the environment variable. So this is called numbers underscore long. So we'll read that in, read that in, and um, we could confirm once again these are playing. Two, one. Yeah, that's working, and two, two. That's working as well. All right. Uh, now uh, we can we can now that we've loaded these buffers onto the server and we've given ourselves language side names to refer to them we can access a variety of types of information in these buffers. So for example, uh, a very obvious thing we can do is to say, how many channels uh, does this buffer have? That is two. That's because the sound file at this path is a stereo sound file. We could check the get info, and sure enough, it's a stereo file, which means this audio file actually has two channels of audio in it, a left and a right or just numbered 0 and 1. Um, uh, on the other hand, num and numl, these both have 
one channel. And we can also see this in the Audacity window here. We've got a stereo motorcycle, and then each of these numbers are mono. So something to keep in mind. Right? Audio files have a different number of channels, and when you just do a plain vanilla buffer.read, SuperCollider is going to allocate a buffer that has that many numbers of channels. So if you, for example, you might have an 8-channel or a 25-channel. It's just really, you know, audio files can have any number of channels. So buffer.read is just going to say, how many channels does this audio file have? And that's how many channels I'm going to allocate in a buffer. Um, all right, more stuff we can do with these buffers. We can say, what's the duration? So it gives us a value in seconds. You can see exactly how long each of these is in seconds. Uh, other things we can do. Okay, so there's something called frames. Uh, num frames. Num frames. Might as well get all of these while we're at it. So frames are kind of like samples. And when I say samples, I mean the individual numbers that make up an audio file. If we zoom in far enough, we could see that audio files, digital audio files, are just a sequence of numbers that represent the amplitude of each sample. So it's all just numerical information, and we can conceptualize the values of these individual samples as being bipolar between minus 1 and positive 1. So just numbers, right? Audio, digital audio is just a sequence of numbers. So what are frames? Well, I'm going to draw a little picture using some super collider code here. And let's see if I can do this. Uh, like that. I'm going to visualize a a stereo audio file here. Right? So here is the left channel and here's the right channel. And so two channels and uh, a left and a right. And now we just have numbers in here, right? Here's a number, here's a number, here's a number, here's a number, right? So a frame Right, it goes on. This is like a fairly short buffer. It just looks like, you know, something like 20, 25 samples. Uh, this right here is a frame. A frame is a, a single sample's worth of time, but it contains all of the samples, one for each channel. Um, uh, so, right, once again, here is a channel. Here is a frame. And each individual X is a sample. So in the case of a monophonic buffer, or in other words, a one-channel buffer, the number of frames equals the number of samples. But in a stereo buffer, the number of samples is equal to the number of frames times the number of channels. You can kind of think of a buffer as like a two-dimensional array. It's got sort of number of samples in one direction, number of channels in the other direction, and then the number of samples is those two numbers multiplied by each other. So when we say uh, moto dot num frames, it's giving us the number of sort of vertical slices, vertical slices we can take. Um, so it contains 525,735 frames. And because this is a two channel audio file, it's actually got this times two number of samples. So just over 1 million samples in it. Because right? twice as many because there's two channels. So those are frames. It's important to keep, uh, keep in mind the difference between frames and samples because they're not exactly the same thing. Um, when we have a digital audio file, um, it has a sample rate associated with it. So uh, for example, you, you, take a you set up a microphone, you set up an interface, you take a recording, and uh, uh, the process of capturing that and then rendering that out as a digital audio file involves imparting some sample rate. On, so those, those samples are meant to be played back at a particular rate. And uh, ever since, you know, all the 
COVID-19 stuff, everyone's kind of on Zoom, and Zoom runs at 48,000 samples per second uh, and can't really be changed. Uh, so these are actually running a different sample. I've kind of moved all my stuff over to 48,000, but when I made this motorcycle recording, I was working at 44.1 samples per second. Um, so these have different sampling rates, and that's going to have some consequences. So it's important to keep in mind, you know, that the server is running at a sampling rate, your digital to analog converter, your sound card, all running at sample rates, and buffers have sample rates, or audio files have sample rates associated with them. Um, okay, and then the last thing I want to point out is uh, something called buff num. So a buff num is simply an integer that gets assigned to a buffer when it is read into memory. And so this buffer's buff num is zero. Um, this one has one, and this one has two. So generally, the server is just going to go, OK, I've got this many buffers loaded, so next integer, next integer. And it's just going to count up. Uh, uh, and, but if you start like sort of removing buffers and adding buffers, this count can get sort of uh, jumbled a little bit. Oh, thank you. I'm so sorry. Thanks for pointing that out. Got to remember to keep my windows properly arranged. Yeah, so the server just assigns, when you, when you say buffer.read, server assigns uh, an integer. Uh, uh, and this is, this is useful. This is going to come into play. It's just every, every buffer has an integer associated with it. So uh, last thing, we can actually clear buffers off the server with the free method. So if we say moto.free and we try to play it, it doesn't work. Cannot play a buffer that has been freed. <clears throat> so once you free a buffer, it's that space is realloc it's it's deallocated and uh, you know it's no longer taking up memory space. Um, and if you want to just free all buffers, you can say buffer dot free all. Actually, send a message to the buffer class and say free all, and that will have the result of. Um, freeing all buffers. Right. I don't know why those are giving me two different types. This one says no UGen data. Uh, this one says, oh, anyway, once you free a buffer, it's gone. You've got to actually read it into memory again. So we just make sure we freed everything here. And let's just uh, load these one more time. Whoa. Something, I, you know what was happening? <laughs> One of them was still playing, I guess. Or, actually, why did it do that? Real. Why did it start playing? I'm not sure. I think I, I must have, uh, I must have uh, freed it and then hit play, and then when I loaded it again, it was all queued up or something. I don't know. Mystery. Okay, let's get into. Okay, now all right, now we're we're gonna get into the the first sort of buffer playing Eugen, but uh, we and we could. It, this is this is fine, but I want to set you all up for good practice, uh, you know, good good coding practice from square one. Um, the problem with reading buffers in like this is that if I were to then send one of you this code and these three sound files these paths would not be accurate. They would point to a location that doesn't exist on your computer because your name's not Eli, um, and maybe you didn't put them on your desktop, uh, or maybe you're on Windows, and so the path is entirely different. Like it starts with C colon backslash or whatever. Um, so this is, this is kind of a sloppy coding. If you're just going to work on your own and never send this to anyone, then it's fine. You know? But uh, it's, even that's kind of risky because you might then someday be like, all right, let's get these off of the desktop and put them in a folder and change their location. And all of a sudden, your code stops working because these paths aren't accurate anymore. So I want to show you the technique that I use to guarantee that these paths are always accurate. And the first thing we're going to do is save this file. Uh, we're just going to call it week seven. And I'm going to put this on my desktop. And there it is. Right, so we've saved this SCD file. And now what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to make a new folder with these four things. Uh, we're going to call this week seven as well. 
and I'm going to put all of these into a folder called audio. Right. So we have a main folder. This is kind of like the same technique that happens when you save like a DAW session where it gives you like a project folder and inside that folder has all of your audio file resources and other things. Um, oh, it's forward slashes on Windows. Okay, yeah, but I rarely use Windows, so I'm not sure. But uh, the point remains. You know, the path is going to be totally different on from computer to computer. So now we have a little project folder for ourselves. Um, and it's got a uh, audio folder and the actual code. So I'm going to, I think if I save this now, it's going to, no, I think it's it's fine with that, right? It's got, uh, all right, so back back here, there is a uh, special, um, uh, I, I don't, I'm not sure what the name is. It's It's a special identifier, kind of like true and false and nil um uh it's uh this process and i'm not going to go into detail about what this process means because it's kind of uh it's kind of looking under the hood a little bit too deeply uh for what we're dealing with right now but um if you if you type this process dot now executing path uh, assuming you've saved your file somewhere on your computer then it's going to give you a string that represents the absolute path to this uh, code file. So this is on users, Eli, desktop, week7.scd. That is the absolute path. Now, if I, uh, you know, if I, yeah, see, this is what I was worried about. It's going gonna, it's gonna to get weirded out because I moved it. So we'll just re save it over here. Yes, replace it. Thank you. All right. Um, Okay, so this is now accurate. I've, I just got to re save this as, save as the same thing and, and overwrite it. So now it's in users Eli on my desktop in a folder called week seven, and the name of this file is week seven .scd. So that's what this process dot now executing path returns, and we can leverage this to our advantage by doing a little bit of code manipulation so that we can return, for example, the path to the folder above it, and maybe the subfolder audio below that. So. Uh, it's going to look like uh, something like this. We're going to use a class called pathName, which is a class that represents paths to files and folder. And so now, instead of a string, it's an instance of a class called pathName, pointing to this code file. And so from here, now that it's a pathName, we can say parent path, and that gives us a string representing uh, the uh, the path to the folder, the, the parent folder of this code file. And since this is a string, we can just confirm with the dot class method that this is in fact a string. We can now just use kind of simple concatenation uh, to uh, add what is necessary here. We can say audio slash, which is the, the folder name of the uh, the folder in which the audio files are stored. So now we have the string users Eli desktop week seven audio, which is this folder right here. And its contents is where we're going to store all of our sound files. So what I recommend you do, let's go ahead and take take these, bring them down here. We're going to modify these read commands so that they are uh, always path accurate. So what I would say is say, um, we, we can just call this like audio path. Or something even shorter if you just want to call it like I don't know path even uh, so that's a string that represents the path to the folder containing the audio files and so now um, we could even put all of this in the same code clump and instead of putting this absolute string here we're gonna say path uh, let's see we're gonna say uh, gonna keep that and we're gonna say path plus plus so now we have this string, which takes us almost all the way to the audio file, and then we just append the name of the file itself. So we can do that here and here as well. So we'll just confirm once again that all the buffers are gone, and then that's what we want. And um, we could play this again, and I guess that'd be kind of a little bit loud, we'll do it anyway real quick. Just to confirm that, sure enough, it's it's in there. Um, also, another fun method, moto.plot. Right? This will show you the 
uh, as best it can what this waveform looks like. Um, it has to render a lot of pixels here. Um, so it's always kind of sloppy and it's always not going to look super great compared to like software, which is sort of dedicated waveform, waveform uh, editing software. But still useful just to see if there is in fact something in the buffer. Okay, so this is this is a key takeaway here, and this is what I'm going to ask all of you who are doing the homework to to do when you uh, load files is to use the the approach which I call the this process dot now executing path approach, which is a way of guaranteeing that uh, paths to files are always accurate. So if I were to send you this this uh, entire project file now, right? If I were to sort of take this folder and and zip it up and uh, just send you a week seven and you unpack that on your computer these paths will all work because they're going to be uh, relative to what this code returns on your computer, wherever you happen to store your project folder. Useful habit to get into, so do do use this. Um, uh, yeah, well, in, in Unix-based paths, I'll, uh, the, the forward slash is a way of, uh, of sort of it designated going into a folder. So, for example, this means um yeah we're in uh this is like the topmost directory we go into the folder users slash the folder eli slash desktop slash these are all as far as the unix folder hierarchy system is concerned these are all folders and then at the very end we don't need a a, a folder once again um so it that's why it ends with um you know the actual file extension so this is what an absolute path looks like, and we're doing some clever tricks with this process that now executing path to make sure it's always correct. All right. Good gravy. Let's move on um, to some unit generators. We've got our buffers loaded, and they're loaded in a way that is robust and reliable and path accurate. So there's two unit generators that play buffers. One of them is called play buff. The other one is called buff read i call it buff read uh one of them plays a buffer one of them reads a buffer the, they have the same overall function but they have fundamentally different designs which make one ugen usually uh more appropriate depending on uh the circumstances sort of what you're actually trying to do with your buffer playback algorithm so we're going to start with play buff play buff is the one that I, I think i tend to use more often i find it pretty easy easy to use so we're going to start with a, a simple ugen function. So we're not going to make a synthdef just yet. We're going to declare a variable that represents the signal we want to hear, and we're going to say playbuff.ar. So playbuff has a couple of arguments, num channels, buff num, rate, trigger, start pause, loop, and done action. So we're going to go through these kind of one by one, play it as we go. The first, uh, first argument to playbuff is the number of channels. And it's important to keep in mind that this argument cannot be modulated. So you can't dynamically change the number of channels of playbuff. This is just the fundamental design of Super Collider. The channel size of your ugen function is fixed at runtime. Um, you have a lot of other flexibility, but you can't dynamically, dynamically multi-channel expand your unit generator. So uh, if you remember from up here, you had three different... Uh, buffers and moto was two and the numbers were each one channel so we have to make a choice here i mean it's we um we have to say either two or one so let's just say two we're going to work with that uh motorcycle for now and then next we need the um the buff num for the buffer we're going to play so we can just say moto dot buff num yes it is zero i don't recommend you put zero here because um as you were, you know, maybe you maybe you sort of load these again, or you free them, or you add some more buffers. It's just you can never really be a hundred percent sure that an integer an integer that you provide here is going to refer to a specific buffer. So it's better to talk to the buffer directly and say, "You give me your buff num." Right? And even this is like a it's still sort of permanently baked into the function, but we're just starting really simple here. Uh, and I'm gonna end that and. Uh, because play buff doesn't have uh, an amplitude argument or a, a mull argument the way like sinosk and pink noise everything have uh, what you want to do to change the amplitude is actually just multiply it by some value and this should play right. 
And we can generate as many of these as we like. So it plays the buffer. You know, we can generate as many as we like. They'll all just overlap. And they get to the end, and they stop. Um, and I have the node tree open here because I want to point out that they're still there. And um, in fact, if we uh, and we don't see any meter activity here, but I'm gonna I'm gonna make another version of these. Uh, we're gonna hit Command Period to clear those off. Um, and we'll say let's copy and paste this. And let's make a make a version of these for the one channel file. So we'll say num. So num is a one channel buffer. So I've gotten and changed the number of channels. And we'll just play a bunch of these. Okay, so once again, all four of those have gotten to the end. The, the synths that we've created by playing this function are still lingering. And in fact, there's some meter activity here. Uh, so yeah, the issue here is the same as uh, envelopes, uh, in that envelopes are um, an object which have a, a finite end. And I, I think what's happening here is that there's just what the value at the end of this file is not exactly zero. It's um it's not exactly zero, and so what's happening is each play buff is outputting that last sample. It got to the end, and it received no further instructions. So that play buff just ran through all of it and then just stays at the end. So we're still actually putting out a little bit of DC bias. Uh, so same issue with envelopes. Um, when you have a UGen that is inherently finite, like nfgen, like play buff, like line, like x line, there is a done action associated with that unit generator. And it's actually the last argument. So we're going to skip ahead and say done action two. So same concept with envelopes. I'm going to hit command period to wipe everything off the server. And now if we play this again, two, one, one, zero. when play buff gets to the end, it checks its done action. Just like when nfgen gets to its end, it checks its done action. And if it's two, that means free the synth, uh, the, the enclosing synth, the synth which contains this done action two. So for one-shot samples, if you just want to play a sound once, and when it gets to the end, you're done. Uh, done action two. All right. Uh, all right, so let's go back to this example here and uh, temporarily turn this down a little bit. Now, if we listen to this, moto.play, and this, So once again, slightly different. Right. Um, Eric, yeah, I guess it's always a good idea to remove DC bias first, but that's not really the problem. The problem is that um, I guess I didn't fade that out completely. Um, so if you do done action two, then any sort of non-zero value at the end of a buffer is not an issue because it'll just kind of Oof, it goes away at the end. Um, yeah, but you could also fade out your audio files a little bit better and make sure there's no DC offset. So the difference between this and this, if you can hear it, it's 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 subtle, but there's a there's a slight pitch discrepancy. Uh, this one sounds like the original file. This one is actually a little bit higher, and this is a result of the fact that the server is running at a sampling rate of forty eight thousand. But this buffer has a sampling rate of 44,100. So when we play it, um, I mean, this this is a very much a shortcut. It does a lot of secret stuff in the background, resampling and whatever it's. So uh, here, this is a more formal example. And we have a buffer at a specific sampling rate, 44,1. And the server is running at the sampling rate of 48,000. And so it needs to align the samples in the buffer with the samples that the server with the server's sample clock. And so as a result, um, these samples, which are relatively sparse, get crunched together a little bit because forty-eight thousand is more samples per second. So what happens is it resamples the audio file so that the pitch goes up slightly because it crunches all those samples together. Um, so uh, that is where um, rate comes in. 
And uh, so rate is a ratio where one means play this, uh, play this buffer at its original rate, exactly as it was recorded according to the, the sample rate of the server. Um, and uh, just bring my volume back here if I can. Uh, oh, just boop. There we go. Now, uh, because num and numl are recorded at 48k and the server's running at 48k, there's no problem that will, you know, one will will play it at its original rate. Two, one, one, zero. And if we say two, it's an octave up. And point five is an octave down. But we have an, another issue we need to deal with when our buffers were recorded at an alternate sampling rate. So there is a UGen called buff rate scale, which is a, a unit generator that you provide it with a buff num, and it returns the ratio of the um, of the buffer sampling rate to the server sampling rate. So it's it's a ratio of the two sampling rates that are involved. And because those are different, it's going to give you a ratio that uh, is is not equal to one, and so it's going to compensate for the um, uh, the shift that happens with the, as a result of these two different sampling rates. Uh, so let's let's do that. Um, so it's a unit generator. We could do KR, um, but even here is a good example where we can use this rare and elusive IR. Um, which is a which causes the UGen to generate one value exactly once when the function is first played, um, because we don't need to be continuously updating this value. We can just say, you know, just take that, and um, this will this will scale it so that it is at the correct rate compared to. Well, let's. I don't want to deafen everybody. I know this is kind of loud. So we have. Right, so now they're exactly the same. And just to show you what's actually coming out of this um, this buff rate scale object, if we can we can use the poll method, which is basically a, a way of uh, uh, periodically measuring unit generator output. So we'll see that it's uh, it's outputting a constant value of 0.91875. When we play a 44.1 buffer on the server running at 48k, it scrunches those samples together. So this ratio causes the, the buffer to sort of spread out again. And in fact, if we do uh, 44,100 divided by 48,000, that's the ratio. So it's, it's, uh, it's compensating for the sample rate discrepancy. All right, so um, working with ratios is, is fine, right? It, it, you know, it's, even though these, uh, before we talk about rate too much, Working, uh, it's 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 even though the number sample and the sample rate of the server are are the same, that they have the same sampling rate. It's not it's never a bad idea to uh, put this value here, just as a uh, as a way of um, sort of guaranteeing that a rate of one is always going to play back the buffer exactly as it's supposed to sound when there's no transposition. So uh, yeah, instead of just putting one or whatever rate you want, you should put buff rate scale times the rate you want. So here's one, right, point five. Now, if we want to think in terms of semitones, uh, you know, if we want to like go up by a major third or something, like this is really clumsy if we think in terms of ratios because we need to, um, you know, this is in in twelve tone equal temperament, going up by n sem semitones means multiplying a frequency by this ratio. So like if we want to go up five semitones, we have to do this. And you know, it's just we have to deal with two to the power of some fraction and it's just it's just kind of clumsy. It's just a lot of it's not a you know it's uh it's not a convenient way of thinking. Um so as a convenience there's a method called MIDI ratio which takes a, a receiver which is a value in semitones and returns the ratio or that that needs to be multiplied by a frequency in order to produce 
that new frequency. So if we're at, you know, four, A440, and we want to go up by five semitones and figure out what's the value in hertz, we just take 440 times five dot MIDI ratio, and that gives us the correct value in hertz. So this is up uh, six semitones, seven semitones. Uh, 12 dot MIDI ratio is an octave. I mean, this is a floating point rounding error, but you can pretty much ignore that. Um, if you want to go down an octave, it's minus 12. Um, so negative values work just as well. So if we want to go, uh, you know, up up by semitones, we can say zero dot MIDI ratio first, and this will just this returns one. So going up by semitones, two. going down, two. 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 pretty easy. So that's convenient. Um, so that that is rate. Um, this buff rate scale is a good habit to get into because it guarantees your sample rates won't be mismatched because it does the compensating for you. And then you can just multiply that by whatever rate you want it to play back at. Um, okay, so after rate, bring this back to uh, zero here, uh, we have trigger and start position. So these kind of go hand in hand. Uh, trigger is a signal that's just, you know, whenever that signal that we provide for trigger uh, undergoes a transition from non-positive to positive, that counts as a trigger. And it's going to cause playback to jump to the start position. Uh, and a start position is a value in frames. So you specify a, a start position in frames, and whenever a trigger occurs, playback jumps to that start position. So let's make a little space for ourselves. I'm gonna I'm gonna use the longer number file. So we'll say num l num l, and um. We'll say, uh, you know, let's, um, I want to do this right. Let's, um, yeah, sure, let's say T underscore trig. So we're going to make ourselves a trigger argument. And then we're going to specify a start position. Now, this sound file has, uh, you know, 779,000 frames. So, I mean, I'm just going to roughly say, halfway through, you know, whatever this value is, divided by two, yeah, three, I guess I could have just estimated that. Let's just say 390,000. So we're going to say, uh, for our start position, 390,000. And so now, when we play this, um, it's actually going to start. Uh, trigger is this trigger is initially one. I think there's also a whenever you s s play a function that has a play buff, it's sort of automatically triggered. It should start in the middle. Eight, one, zero. Yeah, so it started like uh, here or something, somewhere around here. Let's let's rewind this a little bit, maybe to somewhere there. One, zero. Right. So it's starting. Right here. One, zero. And so now once we run this, One, zero. Uh, we need to give it a name. One, zero. Let's see if I'm fast enough. Right. So now because we have an argument, we can uh, we can set it to one whenever we like, and it'll sort of jump up to one and jump back to zero, and that'll cause uh, play buff to jump its internal playback pointer to frame with index three hundred and thirty thousand. Uh, and we have a done action too, so it got all the way to the end, and as you can see on the node tree, it uh, vanished, which means this doesn't work anymore because there is no synth to be set. It's it has disappeared. So if you want to be able to re-trigger, you can set this to uh, done action zero. One, zero. And so we can re-trigger it. And even if we get uh, all the way to the end, Eight, one, zero, five. 
done action two uh, is not present. We have done action zero, which means no action is taken. So even if it reaches the end, we can freely One, jump it back away. to its start position. So that is trig and uh, trigger and start position. And you know, I'd like to take an opportunity now to introduce two unit generators, which are applicable in a variety of contexts. They are impulse and dust, and they are essentially signal generators that generate triggers. Now, lots of signals generate uh, a shape that can be used to trigger things, but impulse and dust are kind of specifically designed to output triggers. So um, let's see. Uh, just to show you what these look like. Um, we need more triggers. Let's do a shorter time span and more triggers. Right. So this is 0 0. Uh, 0.05 seconds worth of 100 triggers per second. So we have these tiny little single sample spikes. They look like they're different amplitudes, but they are not. That's just a consequence of pixel aliasing. They are all full amplitude, 0 to 1, uh, 100 times a second. And dust is kind of similar, except it is stochastic. So it is triggers that are kind of randomly spaced. And these actually are different amplitudes, but it doesn't really matter because a trigger is a transition from non-positive to positive. So I bring these up because they can be used to automate the process of re-triggering a sound file. Let's give it a try. So instead of an argument, uh, here we're going to say um, impulse dot I think AR would work but I'm actually going to do KR because um, uh, it, I don't think it matters in this case but we'll just say four four impulses per second so it's constantly firing off those triggers causing the um, causing the play buff to jump to its start position so we could do eight And I think if we want to go really fast, we, we can basically turn this into an oscillator. Right, that's really obnoxious being in one ear. We're just going to, um, we could just do it down here. X climb two. Yeah, so you can get kind of cool, buzzy, synthy sounds just by um, forcing Playbuff to just cycle through a tiny bit of its signal. Uh, very, very quickly. And even just changing these a little bit is going to drastically change the timbre. Because it's uh, it's cycling through a different chunk of audio. Uh, and dust is, is going to, you know, it's, as you can probably expect, it's going to just randomly re-trigger, but approximately, in this case, once per second. One, 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 zero. One, one, one. So it gets to play however much uh, audio gets to slip in through the cracks before dust says trigger, and it goes ah back to my uh, back to frame number two hundred ninety thousand. Right. One zero one zero. So if we ramp this up quite a bit. Yeah, that's right. Playbuff uh, only has one internal pointer, but of course you can make multiple instances of playbuff. Like you can have you can. Uh, uh, this is kind of a very rigid example because it's stuck with just one buffer and dust is always eight and the start position is always 330,000. But yeah, you can, the thing to do, which I'd like to do before we finish, I don't know if we have time, is to actually make a synth def with lots of arguments. An argument for which buffer you want to play, an argument for the number of semitones to transpose it, and then however you want to manage start position and, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and then okay, there's one last argument that I want to get to and that is uh, loop. So loop is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, we're going to use the short one here because I don't want to have to wait 16 seconds to hear this loop back around. Uh, we will get rid of uh, trigger and start position. And we're going to say loop colon, because we were just we're, if we put it here without loop, it's going to think it's the trigger. So we need to actually say, no, no, skip over trigger and start position. Give me loop. And if we say one, then it is going to loop. And if it's zero, then it's not going to loop. So here we go. Two, one, one, zero, two, one, one, zero, two, one, one, zero. So just to uh, 
to answer to follow up on Jarvis's question here. So we, I could I could run this once and then run it again with a different rate, and we'd have two instances of play buff. And maybe we should actually uh, add them to an array here. Let's say a equals an empty array, and we'll say a equals a dot add this function dot play. Um, so make that, and we'll do this. Maybe a little quieter. thing to remember here is that uh, if if uh, loop is one, then done action is ignored. So even if done action is two and you you run it, you know, like this, done action is two and it is getting to the end. But loop is one, and so uh, that's really quiet. Two, one, one, zero, yeah. So uh, so play buff simply does not check its done action if loop is one. But again, we can make an argument here. Uh, let's go back to just calling it x, just so we're not dealing with arrays. So now if we set loop to zero, uh, all of a sudden, once loop is zero, next time it hits the end of the buffer, it says, oh, what's my done action? Oh, it's two? Okay, I'm out of here. And it disappears. Um... Yeah, right. So there's a lot of a lot of possibilities here. Um, we've been playing really fast and loose uh, with just like function dot play, as you remember from uh, I think it was last week. We talked about synthdef and how it's kind of a more structured, formal way of defining a uGen function. And we've been hardwiring a lot of values in here. For example, this function only ever plays this particular buffer, and right now it's kind of fixed at five and. Um, you know, what we should be doing is, at the very least, giving ourselves tons of arguments for the number, the buff num of the buffer we want to play, the playback rate, uh, a start position, maybe a, a trigger argument, whether it loops or not, uh, and then making synths and like, you know, from a synth def and like specifying all those arguments. And that gives us just tons more flexibility. This, the purpose of this was just to kind of demonstrate how this UGen works and what it's capable of. But, um, you know, for for example, I I always I I say you should never be putting uh, global variables inside of synth defs. Um, you should always be making an argument and then passing in what you want to provide for that argument when you create a synth. We'll we'll get we'll get through all this uh, on next week. So um, yeah, there will be a very short homework assignment this week. We've barely scratched the surface with buffers, and I'm also gonna uh, the midterm is gonna be available at four. Um, I'm also gonna put a link to the midterm exam on the week six video description. But for everyone who's actually in the class, that's on the course website. It's going to become available at four, due 24 hours later. Um, so I think that's it for today. A um, lot to cover with buffers. Big, big, big world of exciting sampling and sound file playback. Uh, yes, I, I'm. these videos are, I have no plans to ever take these down. So these videos will be up. It's kind of an archive of, of various semesters of teaching this class. Um, it, it's my pleasure. Yeah, I, I really like uh, this language. I feel like it's really great, and it's because it's free and open source. I feel like why not, why not share the love? So, yeah, it's uh, I really enjoy it. <laughs> Thanks, Josh. Um, okay, so that's it for me. Uh, as a reminder to everyone in the class, the midterm will become available at four p.m. in seven minutes, and you'll have um, twenty-four hours to complete it and submit it. So thank you again, everyone, for watching. I'll be back same time next week to continue our uh, buffer adventures. So thanks again.